Right now, let's turn on my guest, Dr. E. Michael Jones. Dr. Jones, are you there? Yes, yes. Sir, I want to thank you. Uh, it's really an honor to have you on the show. And uh, I've followed your work for a while, and I, I really commend you on your on a fine magazine and great articles that you've written. Thank you. Could you describe, just very briefly for the audience, what your magazine, Culture Wars, it, it is a magazine, is it not? Yeah, it's a monthly magazine. It's on the web at uh, culturewars.com. It, uh, it's it's uh, basically a magazine about how the culture really works, how it uh, manipulates people, how it uses people, and gets them to conform, how the culture controls them and explains how it works. Well, I think it's a great website, and if somebody wanted to uh, subscribe to this magazine, do you actually mail hard copies? To yeah, a hard copy every month, monthly magazine. Great. Costs $30 a year. You can get the information at the website or at 574-289-9786. Once again, the phone number? 574-289-9786. Great. And their website is uh, www.culturewars.com. Once again, Right. Uh, culturewars.com. Right. Okay, uh, now, <laughs> I, I was shocked to say the least. I thought this was actually a, a put-on. I couldn't believe it was legit. But they're actually, they put on the Vagina Chronicles at a Catholic college? Yeah, actually, it's called the Vagina Monologues. Monologues, right. Uh, yeah, that was the first time it was performed in the South Bend area. It was at St. Mary's College a couple of years back. And uh, I had heard about it before, but I went there and saw the performance. As, as I said in the article, I, you know, uh, the, you know, it's, it's. I wouldn't say it's pornographic, but I would say it's obscene. And uh, part of what they do there is uh, chant all sorts of obscene words uh, as a way of sort of breaking down the the girl's resistance to this type of thing. It's it's a fairly common technique that they use for sex educators, for example. It's called desensitization. Sensitization. It yes. sort of breaks down your resistance to this type of thing. And so I was there, and I, you know, the thought is going through my mind: What if the nuns knew this was going on? But it turns out that the, uh, a nun, Sister Linda Coors, CSC, a Holy Cross nun, was the uh, the main uh, character in the play. Well, <laughs> what is the, where is the Vatican? <laughs> where, where is the Vatican? It's, it's located in Rome. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they seem to be very concerned about abortion and all these other things and homosexual marriage, but they don't care about these uh, types of uh, performance art pieces being performed at a Catholic school with a, well, nu sure with a nun? I'm sure if you mentioned this to one of the cardinals in Rome, he would be very upset. He would roll his eyes. He would do all sorts of things. But <clears throat> the way the church is structured is that they would say it's the local bishop's responsibility to do something about this. So has anybody contacted the local bishop? A number of people have, yeah. And what does he say? Um, he has basically um, he's asked the uh, people. The, he's asked first of all. He's asked the people not to put it on. I mean, in a sense, he's just like a, acting like a private citizen here. He wrote some article in the local paper saying that this is not a good idea, but it, it, there was really no, no sort of follow-through, no saying, you know, no administrative connection here, where it was, uh, it was uh, banned. The, the, what happened here is that uh, the performance was put on at St. Mary's. I wrote my article, the article came out, and then it circulated among the alumni, and they put pressure on the president, and so the president banned it for the next year. But then the students... Uh, well, of course, being agitated by certain faculty members, uh, put on a private performance, and so it was kind of a, an ambiguous situation. And then Notre Dame picked it up, and Notre Dame has done it for the past three years after St. Mary stopped doing it. So it sort of goes back and forth here. And in a sense, it's, it's really an indication of what has happened to Catholic education. It sort of gives you a good insight into what has happened to Catholic education. So in other words, uh, here we have a, a family... That sends their uh, children to a, uh, let's say, St. Mary's. St. Mary's is about $20,000 a year. Uh, they think their, their child is getting a great education. They're in the safety of this Catholic school. They're away from all the horrible things that occur in these uh, city colleges and these uh, universities, the Ivy League 
<clears throat> local universities, the secular universities, let's say, and they put them in a religious university, thinking that they'll be safe. And then here, here we go to the, uh, the, the she, she brings her family to the play known as the Vagina Monologue, a good, wholesome, all-American Catholic performance with a nun as the star. Right. Uh, this is absolutely incredible. What planet do we live on now? Well, what, what happened is that the Catholic education was subverted from within. And uh, St. Mary's claims to be a Catholic college, but it's really a feminist college. And so what you do if you're a Catholic, an unsuspecting Catholic parent, is you pay 20 some thousand dollars a year to send your daughter there for Catholic education, and then they work on her and try, and turn, try to turn her into a feminist. It's, it's another, another word for this is known as social engineering. Education became a form of social engineering. Yes, and that's why people were sending their children to private schools and Catholic schools to escape right. supposedly social engineering. That's right. That's exactly why the Catholics, let's say Catholic grade schools and high schools are an alternative to public schools because public schools are definitely social engineering. This, this, all, this sort of takeover of Catholic colleges got worked out uh, in through uh, in the core over the course of the sixties, the late sixties and early seventies, and it's been codified in the the uh, Constitution of the United States. There were two Supreme Court the same court that we were handed down in the early seventies. One was called Lemon versus Kurtzman, and that said that you could not give federal money to Catholic grade schools and high schools. The other one said was called Tilton versus Richardson, and that said you could give money to Catholic. Uh, colleges and universities because they were secular in purpose. And so what you're seeing here is the sort of the outcome of that. Once that, once that happened, once the federal money started flowing into these places, places like Notre Dame and St. Mary's, it was inevitable that they would become instruments of social ah, engineering. So you're suggesting that it was the influence of federal money going into a private or religious university that basically was the Camel's nose in the tent. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not trying to excuse anybody here. Certainly, no one at, at Notre Dame am I trying to excuse. No, Father, absolutely not. No, Father is... Hesburgh was uh, avid, was lusting after this kind of money, lusting after the approval of the big foundations, which were the prelude to government funding. So let me ask and, you. I'm sorry, Doctor Jones. Uh, continue, please. And did whatever he was willing to make whatever changes uh, he had to make. And I'm saying that the deal, the deal at a place like Notre Dame or St. Mary's is basically, uh, the deal is uh, the federal government will give Notre Dame money if they subject the Catholics that go there to government-approved social engineering. That's the deal. That's why these things just don't get canceled. In other words, uh, every year there's the same experience at Notre Dame, some some uh, pious Catholic freshman from Cincinnati or Cleveland will show up and he'll hear that the vagina miles is going to be performed. This is terrible. How can this happen at a Catholic institution? I'm going to write to Father Malloy, who was the president of uh, this school, and he writes and he gets a kind of blah, blah, blah letter about uh, academic freedom, and that's the end of it. Well, it's the end of it because the government, uh, the government is paying places like Notre Dame to engage in social engineering. And this is a form of social engineering. It's not literature, it's not Shakespeare. When you have these girls in the audience, these Catholic, 18-year-old Catholic girls chanting dirty words, it's not education. It's social engineering. It's desensitization as a prelude to control. It's absolutely the destruction of the uh, family unit as well. Uh, we'll be right back with my guest, Dr. E. Michael Jones editor of Culture Watch magazine, Culture Wars magazine, rather. This is Shank Talk Live. Don't go away. Um, I was reading uh, recently about uh, the idea of these uh, school vouchers, and I've discussed this on the air many times. I'm opposed to school vouchers for the very same reason that you've described uh, the federal money going into Catholic schools and how it's ruined Catholic schools. I believe school vouchers will do the same thing to 
private schools across the United States. How, how do you feel about this, Dr. Jones? I don't know enough about it to, to have an opinion one way or the other. I've really done, not done any research on it. Well, we've, uh, basically what you described to me with federal money going into Catholic schools, and you, and you describe what's happened to Catholic schools, how they're nothing but social engineering workshops, that's my uh, theory. Yeah, now I, I, do, I do make a distinction between grade schools, high schools, and colleges and universities. No money goes to grade schools or high schools, and so they naturally sort of re re reform themselves from the bottom up because every year, you know, people send their children there and they've taught them things at home, and it, it has, uh, has a good effect. The high school right across the street from Notre Dame has gotten better over the course of the past 20 years. My, I have five children, and my, my fifth is going to be going there now, and it's better than it was when my first went, and I think it's simply because they're not paid to engage in social engineering. But that is the case with Catholic colleges and universities. They are paid to engage in social engineering. Sure. Um, so the Vatican has no official position on this. They have no, they've made no statement about these types of performance art pieces being uh, shown or being performed at the uh, Catholic colleges. No, no, they're not going to. They're not going to have an official position on something like the vagina monologues. That would just add, you know, it would just in, uh, be the best thing that ever happened to Eve Ensler if the Vatican came out and said something about it. The local bishop is supposed to be the enforcer in this regard, and uh, they, they, there is a statement called Ex Corde Ecclesiae from the heart of the church, which is supposed to bring the uh, Catholic colleges and universities into line. It's been on the books for years and years and years, and uh, it's it's pretty much gone nowhere. Uh, I mean, I've been reporting on this for 20 years now, and it's pretty much gone nowhere. Yes. So there's a kind of impasse right now. There's a new president coming into Notre Dame. I spoke to the Alumni Association and sort of gave them a talk based on my you know article on the vagina monologues, and, and uh, there were a fair number of people in attendance, and they're all concerned about the Catholic nature of the place and they don't know what to do. I don't, I, they, they know something's wrong. They don't know how to fix it. They, and I think they don't know how to fix it because they don't understand the full dimensions of the problem. Well, <laughs> what about this nun who's the star of the show? I mean, is the, is the nun going to face any kind of uh, punishment or any kind of... It doesn't uh, look that way. I don't think anything's <laughs> happened to her. And, and that's years ago that she did this, she, wow. that she did this performance. They're all so, they, they, they are basically on their own. They've already... I mean, a place like St. Mary's is already a feminist institution. You know, you right. can't criticize feminism. You can criticize the church there, but you can't criticize feminism. And they, in effect, run the place, and they have the power. And no one has been able to stop them. So they do this with impunity. Hmm. Until some... Uh, it, 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 until, I suppose until something like the bishop and the alumni, the concerned alumni... Uh, team up and decide to do something, nothing is going to happen. Because the faculty, I mean, there's a, a, a rigorous selection process among faculty members, and if you say anything that is politically incorrect, you get fired. So, so that concentrates the uh, the social engineers on the faculty. The faculty isn't pretty much nothing but social engineers. Uh, very briefly, if some of the audience is not familiar with this uh, play known as the Vagina Monologue, uh, here's an excerpt from an audition for this play. It says here auditioners were asked to act out with their bodies several different kinds of vaginas, some of which were the premenstrual vagina, the menstrual vagina, pre-orgasm vagina, and the shy and timid vagina. However, I think the favorite of the night was acting out the surprise triple orgasm. Now, this is a nun who's doing this on stage. Yeah. Uh, okay, I thought they were celibate. What is all the triple orgasm? In this I don't know. I, I mean, this is unbelievable. Ask, ask uh, Sister Linda. Give her a call. We need to get We need to get her. We need to get her. Ask her about the orgasm, because that's at least a question I can't answer. I, what would she say? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I get, get Sister Linda on. Linda on. But uh, I don't know what it's like, but I've heard about it, and I'm just a great actress. I mean, maybe she's the Vanessa Redgrave of nuns. 
I don't know. I don't. I don't know. Maybe she's maybe she's just dying to get on your show. This would be a great opportunity. You're right. You're absolutely right. Because I'll tell you, that's uh, amazing. What is uh, very briefly, if you if it's possible, can you tell us in a nutshell what this play is about? What is the idea of the play? Just what, what, in other words, well, what they, they're two. They're two. It's it's basically a fundamentally dishonest piece of uh, of of whatever whatever you want to call it. Because uh, it, it's there, it's, it purports to claim that they want to end violence to women, but basically it's kind of lesbian and uh, and feminist propaganda that would seem to incite the very violence that uh, that wants to avoid. Well, that sounds pretty concise to me. We'll be right back with more on Shank Talk Live and my guest E. Michael Jones, who's editor of Culture Wars magazine. Don't go away. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is Shane Talk Live, and we have a phone call for Dr. Michael Jones right here is uh, Jane in Baltimore, unscreened, uncensored. Come on in, Jane. Yeah, I, I should clear, you know, lay my cards on the table at the outset here because I've read uh, Mr. Jones' magazine and periodical and uh, excerpts from it and commentary on it and everything else. So I have my own views on it. I'm, I'm of course, as you know, Peter, as you know, I'm a militant secularist. Okay. Uh, I'm not an inherit of any of these cults, but I'm fascinated by them, and I think there's a lot of wisdom literature that I continue to study on, a, on almost a daily basis from a variety of different religions. Um, and the Catholic Church, you know, obviously I have a, a particular interest in that because the, the evolution of the Catholic Church, you might just as well be talking about the evolution of Western civilization. Western civilization it is in effect Christendom, from you know from a practical point of view. Yes, it is. I agree with you. But I I I like the post I like the post Enlightenment side of it, and probably uh, your guest is is more oriented toward the pre Enlightenment side of it. I I want to say at the outset that I, I don't really know much about uh, the performance art that goes on on Catholic campuses, but having having attended classes taught by Jesuit instructors at places like Loyola here in Baltimore, and I have friends who are taking classes at Georgetown, I can assert that the mathematics, physics, and computer science departments at those institutions are outstanding. And if anyone's uh, considering you know, sending their son or daughter to learn those sciences, the Catholic universities that I've had exposure to are, 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 are probably the best. Indeed, I consider the Catholic Church's university system to be the jewel in the crown of the church, and uh, notwithstanding whatever problems it's having now with the, you know, the, you know, the, the, the gay issue and the, the, uh, the legal problems surrounding the pedophilia and everything else, I certainly hope that the Catholic Church will continue to maintain uh, academic standards in those institutions and not succumb to the lure of things like gender norming or race norming which I'm sure, you know, your guests probably would agree with. Well, do you have a, do you have a question for Dr. I Jones? I did. I wanted to know, I wanted him to comment on the Pope's condemnation of the war in Iraq as an unjust war. Um, and, you know, he based all, he based that on, you know, uh, uh, precedents for canon law and, and historical precedents and everything else. And I also wanted to ask him to comment on what he thinks the cultural impact of that is in terms of creating ambivalence among American Catholics, and I'll hang up and listen to his response. Thank you, Jane. Dr. Jones? Yeah, the, the Pope did condemn the uh, invasion of Iraq as an, in, an unjust war, and it's based on principles that are fairly old and fairly accepted, you know, um, and uh, likelihood of success, you know, uh, all sorts of things. I think I, I agree with the Pope. I think he was right. I think it was an unjust war. I have to agree with you as well. Uh, I think he was. Uh, I think it was the, the shame of the situation was that there are all these Catholic neocons out there who were saying how how loyal they were to the Pope, and then as soon as he opens his mouth on the war in Iraq, suddenly they're telling everybody you don't have to listen to the Pope anymore. Yeah. Uh, Michael Novak comes to mind. George Weigel comes to mind. I could give you a whole list of people like that. So yeah, I agree with I agreed with the Pope, and I think he, the Bush George Bush should have listened to him. And the tragedy is that he didn't, and now we got this mess in our hands. Well, uh, in addition, I I noticed on your uh, website here you have a uh, credo that that goes as follows: No social progress 
outside the moral order. Right. And I have to applaud you. That is a fantastic uh, credo, and that's uh, it's something we should all remember. Uh, yeah, it's taken from the uh, Quadragesimo Anno by Pius XI, so oh. it's it's not my. I'd like to take credit for it, but it's not my idea. Well, it's. Well, a, I mean, it's simply the conventional wisdom of the West. I think. I think that what we're seeing here. What 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 is what this lady called in, have to, uh, uh, and her t- take on Catholic universities and the vagina marks? What do they have to, to, in common? What we saw over the period beginning with the sixties was a sexualization of the entire American culture, and that meant a sexualization of the Catholic clergy, and that has ultimately led to this debacle with uh, child molesting, which is just sort of the tip of the the iceberg in terms of sexuality. I mean. In other words, there were all sorts of people acting out sexually and who were not going to be cr- uh, tried in criminal proceedings, but it had a devastating effect on the Catholic Church. And the point of the vagina monologues is the same thing. It's just the latest example of how do you sexualize a group of people uh, in order to bring them under control. Because I think that is the purpose. I've written a book called Libido Dominandi, Sexual Liberation as Political Control. The point of this is you sexualize a culture in order to control it. And that is one of the most effective forms of control there is. And that's what you see uh, across the board with these Catholic institutions. Is there an example in past history of a society uh, doing this? Sexualizing well, a, recent, a recent example that I've cited many times is when the Israelis invaded Ramallah. They took over the TV stations and started broadcasting uh, pornography. Yes. Now, I I said this, I've given talks where I've mentioned this, in Austria and in Washington, D.C. In both instances, people, Palestinians, came up to me and said, yes, I was there, that happened, and and this is something more that you don't even know about. For example, one lady told me that uh, there was a curfew, and so the only way that they had uh, could get information was through the television, and all of this is pornography. Now, according to... The world, the world, according to Larry Flint, pornography means liberation. So that must mean the Israelis wanted to liberate the Palestinians. Well, that's wrong. What you, what you see here is the pornography is a political weapon, and it's used to weaken people, and that's the purpose of it. And so what you have in America is a kind of warfare where certain groups are trying to weaken other groups, and one of the groups that really needed to be weakened, according to a number of people, was the Catholic Church. At this period in time, we're talking about the '60s. They used the same technique in Afghanistan when they uh, invaded Afghanistan. They immediately uh, put television sets in all the homes and started broadcasting pornography. Right. The same thing in Iraq. All the t- the uh, satellite dishes followed the troops within a matter of days, and that is the way. That's the way of colonizing people. And so this is and Eve Ensler. Uh, this year said she showed up at Notre Dame this year and she said that she was targeting religious institutions this year well wait a minute Eve what do you mean targeting and secondly I thought it was to prevent violence are you saying there's more violence on religious campuses and and on non-religious campuses that's hard to believe what you're saying is that she wants to break down and weaken these last vestiges of uh, religious and moral um, order in this culture well, when you, when you destroy the moral order, essentially you've destroyed the bulwark of the family. Uh, right. The family. If you destroy the family, yeah. you have nothing but ruthless individuals, yeah. and these people are easy to control. Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better myself. That's exactly what's going on. It's to, the idea is, is to destroy the family so they can control the population. Yeah. That's what it's all about. Let's go to another phone call right now. Doug in Bastrop, you're on the air live, unscreened, uncensored. Come on in. Yeah, you remember, Peter, uh, several years ago, this was a big deal in uh, New York where Rudy Giuliani's wife was uh, playing a role in the (laughs) the vagina vagina monologue. Yes. Rudy Giuliani's wife. Right. Yes, that's true. My gosh. Uh Uh-huh. Hmm. And, uh, now his ex-wife. Hmm. Right. Well, I don't think they ever were, actually. I think it was just some kind of a convenient arrangement. I don't think they, there was ever actually much going on there since he had his mistresses and this and that and other. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was inspired by that, that 
play. I've never seen it or anything, but I figured, well, if they can make money off of it, I, I was writing up a little screenplay called The Penis Soliloquy. So now that I've heard that it's, it's uh, possibly be destructive to the morals of the country, I might, I'll put my money making uh, effort aside. Won't continue. Mean yes, we know, uh, Doug. Asked it. If, we, if I had some uh, laughter and a drum roll, I'd give it to you. Uh, how about a question for our, for our guest here? Uh, well, you know, in the Bible it says that Jesus says that the root of all evil is the love of money. And every night, every night, we just we come back to the same thing where the federal government steals our money. And they corrupt people with it. And there are just so many people out there that are willing to uh, take their little hand out and, and do their social engineering or whatever. So the people who control the money, control the morals. They, they can give yeah, MTV and, and uh, you know, the filth is put forth on them on a daily basis. <laughs> so it's just all, it's real simple. You just look, you know, You've got the money, you've got the people, you you buy the, the morals of the nation, and that's about it. All right. You know, what else can you say? Well, thank you for the phone call, Doug. Uh, you, you have an interesting article in your magazine uh, written by Anthony, is it Anthony Basil? Bazili. Bazili, Anthony Bazili, and the title of the article is Crucified between two thieves, Catholic social teaching versus right and left. And then the, the first uh, paragraph, it says, The rhetoric of freedom, free market and free sex. And then there's a quote, The media, a small set of very large corporations, reports that the economy is always getting better, but hardly clarifies the issue. Better for whom? Large corporations like the media? This is a uh, very poignant, I think. Uh, this is a, the idea of this uh, free market system and making money at all costs being the, the number one uh, purpose for our existence in this country is it, just turning morality on its head. Yeah, I think I think I could take it to an even broader level. It's uh, Saint Augustine wrote a book called The City of God, and he divided all of history into the struggle between two cities, the city of God and the city of man. And the city of God is based on love and service to your fellow man, and the city of man is based on the opposite, which is what his phrase for that is called libido dominandi, the lust to dominate other people. And what you're talking about, when a culture turns away from the gospel, when it turns away from morality, it has to turn in that direction. And so what you have is more and more sophisticated forms of control in this culture. And I'm saying that sexual liberation is one of the most sophisticated forms of control that there is because you identify completely with your oppressor because your oppressor is your own, the man who is manipulating your desires, your your illicit desires. And I think that that's... The, the economic domination and the, the sexual domination simply go hand in hand. You can't, you can't have one without the other. If people were suddenly deprived of their televisions and deprived of their pornography, they'd be annoyed. They'd do something. They'd start talking to each other, and they might, they might organize politically. Uh, conversely, the purpose of all this is to keep everyone isolated and under control. Well, uh, again... <laughs> It seems like all the laws that are being passed with the, uh, the uh, curfew laws and the uh, roadblocks and all these things are designed to basically persuade people not to go out, not to go to a public place and assemble and talk, because that's trouble for the government. That's trouble for the order. Uh, to have people actually sit down in a room in a public place, let's say a bar, for instance, and discuss politics? Well, that's uh, unheard of today because in bars, you've got television sets. Yeah, you can't everywhere. get away from television, can you? Whether it's airports or bars or restaurants, you, ju you just can't get away from it. And you know why those television sets are in those bars? Because somebody uh, wrote, a, wrote a, a study that said, 
you can sell more drinks if you've got a television set in your bar. So, because these people want to make more money, they put television sets in the bar, and as a result, they're contributing to the brainwashing of society. It's all about making money. That's my point. Yeah, but there, there's, there's another element, too, because the government determines how you're allowed to make money. And for a long time, obscenity was simply not a way that you were allowed to make money, even though everybody knew you could make a lot of money off of it. And it's, at some point, the government just changed the regulations on this thing, you know, throughout, beginning with the Roth decision in 57 and all throughout the 60s, they simply changed the uh, the regulations until the culmination of this was the Clinton administration, where they basically stopped prosecuting pornography. And that led to the greatest spread of pornography in history through the uh, through the new medium, the uh, the computer, the Internet. Well, many prominent Marxists were uh, advocates of free love, uh, free sex back in the 50s and 60s. So would you say that maybe Marxism uh, had some kind of influence in this change, in this social change? Well, the, cru the crucial figure in this regard was Wilhelm Reich, who was a communist and a Freudian. And he sort of wrote the Bible for the political use of sexuality. It's called uh, The Mass Psychology of Fascism. It was written in 1933, and it's just a gold mine of information about how sexuality can be used uh, to control people. Now, the, you know, this, the Soviet Union during the 20s was the mecca for sexual liberationists, but it nearly tore the society apart, so they had to back away from it. Uh, that's the downside of all of these things is that, that, you know, you arouse the passions and you think you're going to be able to use them, manipulate them for your own benefit, but they tend to get out of control. And think, go ahead. I was going to say, in, in, in your uh, magazine, Culture Wars, do you discuss the uh, so-called New World Order? Some people believe there's an actual group of individuals working towards a New World Order. Others don't believe in it. Uh, what is your position on well, this? Well, the big, I think the big, the big event was the, uh, the neoconservative takeover of the, uh, the Bush administration, foreign policy of the Bush administration, because that was basically a civil war in the New World Order. I mean, you may have heard that uh, George Soros uh, uh, spent a lot of money to get Bush unseated uh, so that he wouldn't be reelected. George Soros is Mr. New World Order, and he didn't like—he doesn't like George Bush at all. So what you had was a kind of unilateralism uh, among uh, from the Americans that, in many ways, put a uh, uh, put a, uh, a monkey wrench in the gears of the New World Order. Huh. So basically, it's a, a situation of two different groups trying to jockey for position. Yeah, that's usually what history is all about: it's two groups fighting over the same booty. I see. Well, we'll be right back with the closing segment of Shank Talk Live with my guest, Dr. E. Michael Jones, editor of Culture Wars magazine. Don't go away because there is more. Thank you. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. My guest today has been... Dr. E. Michael Jones, editor of Culture Wars magazine. And you can uh, visit this website, culturewars.com. They have some great articles. It's a great magazine. And if you'd like to uh, subscribe to this magazine, there's a phone number on the website. Call it up and uh, get yourself uh, a year subscription. I believe it's $30 a year. Once again, that's culturewars.com. Uh, Dr. Jones, I just want to thank you before we continue. Uh, you've been a great guest, and I do appreciate the time, and I'm very honored that you made this appearance on the show. Well, thank you for having me. I mean, it's very enlightening. You've got a lot of great information here. You've, it's one of the best websites, I think, on the Internet. Well, thank you. Yes, it's great. Um, well, you know, we've talked a lot about the, the moral atmosphere, the moral uh, uh, dilemma in this country in the Catholic schools, and I guess in society in general, and how uh, pornography is being used to control the masses. Now, I guess the next question would be, what do you predict as you, with all the information that you have in front of you, and what you, what you see, and what you know, and all the books you've written, what, where do you see us going as a nation? What, where do you see the world going? Well, I just, I just went to the Detroit uh, Festival 
last weekend, and it was this kind of a music art festival, and uh, didn't hear one word sung in English the whole time. It was kind of like nothing but ethnic music. I think the point is that America is headed toward a kind of re-ethnicization at this point because there's no over overarching culture. The net result of social engineering is that it destroyed trust. It destroyed trust in the government, destroyed trust in authority. And so people are going to have to restore trust by reestablishing small local communities, the places that you mentioned, you know, the bar or whatever, where you can actually talk to people who are actually there in the room with you. You know, and I think that this is this is always the response to empire. I think it's significant that uh, Cardinal Ratzinger chose the name Benedict as the name of the Pope. It was Benedict who created Europe when the Roman Empire collapsed, when the Goths were pouring over the Danube and pillaging, because he created little communities. And that's what we got to do. All right. Well, it's I agree with you, and it's, a, it's something that's very important. We need to get out of the chat rooms and start getting out there in the public square and interacting with real people not just computer screens. Absolutely. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you for being a guest. And once again, I wish you much success with all your endeavors. Thank you. God bless you, sir. Okay. Bye-bye. Well, that's a uh, great, great way to end the week, I think. Uh, I've, I've had a great week, a lot of great guests. Uh, I thought uh, Dr. Jones was a fantastic guest. I hope you enjoyed it, my friends. Uh, once again, you need to check out his magazine, culturewars.com, on the web. And maybe uh, order order some uh, magazines, get a year subscription. I prefer reading these articles in a traditional magazine format, not uh, on a computer screen. But, uh, you know, just uh, get involved. Read. Read as much as you can. And uh, do not send your kids to public school. And I guess uh, if you send them to a Catholic school, you better find out what kind of plays are being performed at your particular Catholic school. I mean, who knows? They might be performing the penis soliloquy next, written by Doug and Bastrop. Who knows? But uh, this is uh, Peter Shank signing off.